pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today, Ken Woolley, or Kenneth M. Woolley. He has a son that's also a Kenneth, and so sometimes they get a little confused, but Ken has been with both my brother-in-law, that first got to know was when he married my sister, Athelia, who is also here with us today. Um, but many, many years ago, uh, even doing very beginning, uh, he is a more than a serial entrepreneur, he is actually a multitasking entrepreneur, and has been involved with, my guess, pretty close to 100 companies. Uh, most recently, Ken is serving as the executive chairman of Extra Space Storage. Extra Space Storage is listed on the New York Stock Exchange and is currently the largest company with its headquarters in the state of Utah. Uh, with assets in over 24 states uh, that are self stored I think you will know, really talk a little bit about that company. Ken and I got started when he was a, a beginning entrepreneur importing cars from England and I would help him deliver things, uh, some of those cars that he was importing. Um, when I was in college in Provo, we actually did some of our very first real estate ventures together where we would find homes to, to fix up and build and uh, remodel and then resell. He has done many, many things from uh, being involved with an airline uh, that he helped start. Uh, he's been involved in manufacturing and high tech. Uh, any of you that have used a laptop that has one of those touch pads, that was one of the companies he was directly involved with. Many, many companies, I don't know which ones he'll tell you about, Richmond Ice Cream in England, many, many companies. But we're really thrilled to have him here. He recently served as a mission president and he along with the Thetis served as mission president in the Russia West mission. Uh, we're really glad to have uh, Dr. Willie here with us. He also served as a professor at BYU Provo as an adjunct professor teaching strategy for, I believe, 16 years over the time. And the way that I actually first got involved in any teaching of classes was he has always been an entrepreneur, and I once looked at how much traveling he was doing. Um, many, many weeks, most weeks out of the year he was traveling, but sometimes when he did that I would cover for him in his classes as he taught strategy at, in the business school at BYU Provo. So please join me in welcoming uh, Brother Ken Woolley. Thank you. For um, driving here to uh, Laia, is that how you say it, Laia? Laia uh, today um, brought back some very important memories for me. You know, there's something about uh, Laia and entrepreneurship, and it goes deep into my roots. I have a very entrepreneurial great-grandfather, his name was Hiram Smith Woolley. And he was born in Utah in 1852 in a wagon box. He later uh, migrated and moved up to Paris, Idaho, where in 1872, and when he was 20, Brigham Young uh, came to visit Paris, uh, and he saw my great-great-grandfather, and he knew him from Salt Lake, because he knew his father, and he suggested to him that he might want to marry the girl next door. Her name was Minerva and that if he would marry her, that he would immediately call him on a mission to Hawaii. And my great-grandfather told Brigham Young that uh, he would be happy to comply, but he wasn't sure that she would comply because he hadn't asked her yet. So subsequently, he asked Minerva to marry her, and she said yes. And uh, within a week after they got married in Salt Lake, they were on a train to San Francisco and on a boat to Honolulu, and served as missionaries here in Hawaii in the late EA uh, for four years. And their first two children were born here and he was uh, involved with the church uh, plantation here in, in Hawaii. And uh, that's a long time ago. I don't know how many of you realize the church was here in those days in Laie. Uh, and had a presence, uh, but my great-grandfather loved Hawaii. Uh, he came back, his wife particularly speaking Hawaiian, and he not so well. 
And uh, my other grandfather on my mother's side also served a mission here in 1898 and uh, was a missionary here in Hawaii. But my great great grand my great grandfather Hiram Smith Woolley went on to be a, a quite an interesting entrepreneur. He uh, was involved in mining and oil and uh, uh, railroad building and other pursuits, ranching, horse ranching, uh, and I suppose I got some of my genes from him uh, because it's sort of in our woolly family heritage. I was raised in Northern California. I was born in the Los Angeles area. And as a young person, I always wanted to see if there was a better way to do things. And uh, my father believed that I should uh, make my own way in the world. He didn't believe in supporting me or giving me money or even giving me an allowance. And anything I earned, I had to earn myself. And uh, when I was in eighth grade, I started my first business. Uh, it was a kind of a dumb business, but it, it did make me some money. And I was uh, buying and selling coins and stamps. And uh, in those days, collector coins and collector stamps were quite a thing. And a lot of young people were, 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 were collecting them. And I made a little living doing that. But it wasn't long before I switched. I was very interested in uh, TVs and radios. In those days, there weren't any computers. And uh, I was a physics student and was very interested in electronics. And I started my own TV repair business. And uh, so by the time I was a senior in high school, I was, I was uh, uh, making a pretty good living repairing radios and televisions in the attic of my home. But I got very interested in cars and uh, things like that. And it wasn't long before I figured out that buying and selling cars was better than repairing televisions. And, uh, and, I, I, and so I started doing that. But then I, got, I, I was sent on a mission. And I was on a mission in London, England. And while I was there, I noticed that there were a lot of old cars in England. And a, a friend of mine from high school came over to England to see me. He wasn't a Latter-day Saint, but he came and visited me on my mission. And he said, Ken, we had to buy some of these cars and bring them to the US. They'd sell for a lot more than they do here. And I says, good idea. So as soon as I got off my mission, we uh, decided to start a business. Now, uh, we didn't have any money. And of course, you want to start a business, you've got to have money. And so uh, we thought, well, who can we get money from? He said, well, I have a friend who has money. He's a, a doctor, and I know he has a lot of money. So we went to his friend and asked him if he would invest in our business. And he kind of looked at us and, uh, and said, well, he would, and that he would lend us $10,000. Now, I, I looked at the, uh, that was in 1967, and the inflation since then has been about eight times. So that's like borrowing $80,000 today. So it's a lot of money. And he lent us $10,000, and he, he didn't want to take a big piece of the action. He wanted 10% of the profits. We said, great. So we took his $10,000, and we started buying cars and, and bringing them from England to the US. Uh, and, over, and both of us were in the university at the time. I was at Brigham Young University studying physics, and he was at uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. We would bring the cars to uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and we would uh, uh, advertise them in Road and Track magazine and sell them. And, and actually, both of us were supported all the way through undergraduate and into graduate school as a result of this car importing business. But it wasn't very long before I realized that cars are sort of, they're small. I mean, they, what's a car worth? And even, even today, what's a car worth? $10,000 to $50,000? And I realized that you could do a lot better buying and selling homes. And so I got into that. But I want to just go back for a minute and talk about motivation and what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't know it at the time, because I didn't even know I was going to be an entrepreneur. I just knew I wanted to be a business person. And I went to business school, and I'm very grateful for my father to, who encouraged me to go to business school. I was intending to be a scientist. And he said, no, you're not made out to be a scientist. And, uh, and I switched, and I went to and got an MBA and stayed on and got a PhD in business, in strategy. Unfortunately, my father, who was a businessman, died 
right when I started business school. So I never got the benefit of his advice or counsel or help uh, after that. Uh, soon after that, I, I went on and uh, went to work for a management consulting firm in Boston. And uh, from there, I worked for a private family company in Cody, Wyoming. I had a PhD in business and business strategy. And I had an offer to teach at the Harvard Business School. And I turned the offer down and went to work as a management consultant. And I'm very glad I did because I found out that you, did, you can't learn business just by doing it in books and studying it. You have to learn it by doing it as well. I think business school is very valuable and learning the constructs of business through business school is extremely valuable, but having practical experience is also very valuable in business. Now, many of you who want to be entrepreneurs may want to start your business right after you get out of BYU-Hawaii. And uh, some of you will do that. But I don't think that's a very good idea. And let me tell you why. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and what you don't know is how a business operates, and you don't know all the different aspects of the things that can go wrong in your business. And if you, if you work for somebody else for a few years in business and gain experience, sort of at the expense of the owner of the business, maybe it won't be negative because you'll make some mistakes. By the t time a few years have passed, you'll have gained enough experience that you'll have a greater ability to start a business yourself. Many, many people that I've met uh, get to be 30 years old with a few children, and then 35 with a few more children, and then they're called to be the bishop, and or the young men's president, and they're 40 years old, and they have this desire to start a business, but you know, five children later, and a house mortgage and the cars and other expenses cause them to be, what? More conservative and less risk, uh, willing to take risk because if, if it should fail, uh, they may not have enough to support their family. And what we find is that as people get older, their, their willingness to risk usually goes down and uh, often very few people start businesses from scratch after the age of 40. So what is my advice? If you want to be an entrepreneur, my advice would be get a few years of experience at somebody else's expense. Wait until you're 30, 32, 33, 35, in that range. Don't wait too long until you get too old and too conservative. Um, you'll also have more opportunities come your way and you'll see a vision of business if you worked in business and you'll see more clearly what opportunities can present themselves. In my case, um, you'll see a uh, picture up there of a self-storage that we built in uh, Antelope, California, which is near uh, Sacramento. When I was at business school, I worked for my former bishop when I was growing up uh, as his intern in his office, and he was developing self-storage. This is in 1969. He was the very first entrepreneur in the Bay Area to build a self-storage property. And it was very profitable, and I, I helped him. And I thought, this is a good business. And I went to, uh, soon after I graduated with my doctor's degree, I went to work in Boston for the Boston Consulting Group. And I noticed there was no self-storage in Boston. I thought, well, if self-storage works in California, why wouldn't it work in Boston? And I kind of put that in my head, but you know, I was 26 years old. I didn't have any money. I couldn't build a self-storage. Um, I left that Boston Consulting Group a few years later and moved to Wyoming to work for my uh, uh, college roommate's family. Uh, he had been my missionary companion, my college roommate, best man at my wedding. He called me up one day and said, hey, my dad's going on a mission. Uh, we'd love to have you come work for our family company. Would you move to Cody, Wyoming? Now, Cody, Wyoming is a, a town of 5,000 people, uh, very distant. It's 100 miles from Billings, which is the closest real town of any size. 
Uh, it's on the east entrance to Yellowstone Park. It's a beautiful place. Uh, and I, for me, I thought that was heaven. I'm not sure my wife did. Uh, so moved to Wyoming. But we moved to Wyoming, and this company was involved in a number of different businesses, uh, including real estate development, oil and gas drilling, uh, ranching. They had a manufacturing business making ear tags for cattle identification. And I found myself at age 28, the president of Witex Corporation, making ear tags for cattle. And I think Richard Tanner came to work for me one summer. Isn't that right, Richard? I did. Didn't you come work as an intern at, at, at Witex? Yeah, you did. Um, and it was very interesting. I learned a great deal. I was probably too young to be president of a company. Uh, we had 160 employees and manufacturing facility, and we sold our product in 30 different countries. It was very interesting for me, and I really enjoyed uh, traveling to different countries. And we set up joint ventures in Brazil and South Africa and Mexico and uh, where else? England. Uh, and in England, I met a man who became a lifelong friend. And his name was Jonathan Robner. And he, we became partners, our company partners. He was about 15 years older than I was. He was, he was wealthy. Uh, and he, he took a liking to me as an entrepreneur or as a, just as a young man. And we became fast friends. And even we even had family vacations together. And about five years later, he said to me, Ken, why aren't you going off on your own? Why aren't you working for someone else? If you go off on your own, I'll help back you. And uh, I'd been thinking about it a lot. And uh, so I quit my job. And I moved to Provo. But I was kind of hedging my bets because um, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a professor or an entrepreneur. So I took a job at BYU as an associate professor of business and with an agreement with the dean that I teach two days a week, and I was teaching business strategy, and I started Extra Space Storage, which is the company that was in the storage business. And I also started a house building company. After I left, my employer, my previous employer, came to me and said, uh, we'd like to be your partner. And they put up the funds to get Extra Space started. My British friend, put up the funds to start a, uh, a house building business. So this is how extra space storage got started. This is the thing that you see here. And I'm going to just show you. Some of you have seen storage. How many of you have ever used a self-storage just by raise of hands? OK, some of you have. They're in every state now. At that time, they weren't. Soon after I started the company, really getting going in 1979, Richard Tanner came to work for me. And he became a partner in uh, about three or four months after we started the company. So Richard and I worked at this together. It wasn't long before we saw the opportunity in Boston, and, and Richard had just gotten married to Sean, and uh, they were off to Boston and lived there for 25 years? How many years? 21. 21 years. And how many self-storage properties did you build in the nor Northeast? So he built over 30 self-storage properties in Massachusetts, and um, I had a bad, I, I have a bad characteristic as a person, and I know this about myself, and I, I can't always uh, uh, help myself, and that is that I, I'm interested in a lot of different things, and I tend to get involved in too many things. And uh, during that, during the 80s, uh, with my English partner, we founded an ice cream manufacturing company in England. And we founded a real estate company to develop apartments in London. And we founded a sausage making company in southern England. And we founded a, a chain of retail stores selling frozen foods. And I got involved in a mining company. And I co-founded a, a company that was making, mo I was involved with a company making motives and I helped take them public. And, uh, and I was a co-founder of a company making track pads, the things that you, know, you use on the, it's, it was, we actually sold the uh, rights to Apple, and it's the same technology that's used to uh, sense your finger on an Apple iPhone. And uh, in the meantime, we were building self-storage, 
And uh, I also got involved in building apartments. And one day, BYU asked me to teach a class. I had by this time gone part-time at BYU, and I hadn't taught for several years. And in 1998, uh, actually Christmas of 97, I was sitting uh, in Africa with my f uh, at a game resort, game lodge. I had brought my family there to go on a safari, and four days before we left, I had um, broken my collarbone by slipping on the ice and falling. And it was very painful, and I really shouldn't have gone to Africa, but I did anyway, because our I had five daughters and a son, and my wife all going to Africa, so we went. But I couldn't go around in a jeep looking at, at uh, lions and, and uh, giraffes. So I sat in camp and studied to bone up so I could teach a course in strategy. And as I was reading about corporate strategy, I started thinking about my life and about my own strategy. And I thought to myself, you know, one of the great principles of corporate strategy is, and this is really important for you entrepreneurs, is that you should focus on the things that you are best at. Whatever you're good at, focus on those and use those energies and what you know the best in your business efforts. And this is true of companies as well as individuals. And I thought about my own life and I thought, well, I've kind of lived a scattered life doing all, all these different things and, and uh, uh, maybe I should focus on self-storage. That's what I knew the best. And we had, in that period, our company had bought and sold a lot of properties. Many of the properties Richard and I had built were uh, sold off. And we only owned, I think, 12 properties at the time, even though we had developed over 60. So I came back uh, from Africa and I talked to Richard. I think, you remember me talking to you? 19, early 1998. Uh, some of our staff, we had nine people in our office. I said, we're gonna build extra space into a real company. And uh, I, I started thinking, well, what do I need to do this? Well, one of the things I knew I needed was I needed someone in Salt Lake, where I was living, who could be, uh, build the organization, someone who had better organization skills than I did. I also knew I needed money, someone with money. So I approached a friend who had been a very successful entrepreneur in the high tech business, and I'd helped him take his company public, and asked him if he would join me. His name is Spencer Kirk. And after some discussion, he said, no, Ken, I don't want to be in self-storage. I said, why? He says, well, you're driving down the freeway, and you see some cinder block buildings, and there's concertina wire around them, and you go around to the front, and there's a guy with a tank top and tattoos smoking a cigarette uh, with a guard dog uh, and an old Camaro looking over your stuff. That's his image, you know. And uh, you've seen a lot of people here in Hawaii like that, right? <laughs> and that's not a professional image. And uh, I said, no, Spence, that's not how it is. So I took him to Los Angeles, showed him some new properties we were building. And you can see here, I'll just go through some of these. That doesn't look like a chain link fence with a guard dog and a guy with a tank top. These are all properties we built. That's in Belmont, California. Bonita, isn't that? That almost looks like a hotel, doesn't it? That's in Chicago. Culver City, California. Gurney, Illinois, that's near um, Chicago. Hylia, Florida. Lake Worth, Florida. Los Angeles. Phoenix, San Leandro. It's a different image, isn't it, than you may have seen even here in Hawaii. And after I showed him some properties that we were building, he said, okay, Ken, I'll come in with you. So we met with, I met with 21 different institutions about investing with us. And finally, Prudential Insurance Company's real estate division agreed or gave us a term sheet to invest a hundred million dollars with extra space in a partnership. Well, to me, that was just a huge amount of money. 
Now, it took some negotiation. We finally came to an agreement, and they effectively, we merged everything we were doing into one new entity with Prudential. And after we did this, and we had Prudential as a partner to fund money, I asked the guy at Prudential, why did you invest in such a small company as Extra Space? And he said something very interesting. He said, because I checked you out. I said, what do you mean you checked me out? And then he told me this story. He said that he had called one of our competitors that I had worked with some years earlier. And it was true. There was a company called Public Storage that I had worked for 15 years earlier. And subsequent to that, Richard and I were building properties and selling them to public storage. And as part of the sale, we would guarantee the income of the property uh, for three years. And we would personally guarantee that we would come up with the cash if the income didn't work out. Well, we had one in Massachusetts in Springfield that we sold to them about 1988. And, uh, the economy went in the tank. Now remember what happened to the economy in the U.S. in 2009, right? 2008, 2009. Well, we had another one of those in 1989, 1990. They called it, they used to call Massachusetts the Massachusetts miracle, and then they called it the Massachusetts bust. And uh, we saw the bust, and the property didn't lease up, and at the end of the three years, we owed public storage, I think it was $270,000. And I had personally guaranteed it, and I didn't have the money. And I was upset because I didn't feel like they managed the property well enough. That was in my heart. But I thought, I, I knew that I still owed them the money. So I called them up and I said, look, I don't have the money to pay you. But I'll, I'll do whatever I can to make it up to you. I'll sign a note. I'll sign an agreement. Give me some time to pay you. And they said, OK. And I signed a note. And uh, over a period of two or three years, I paid them off. And I, I never thought much more about it. Well, now, flash forward about nine, eight or nine more years, and the guy from Prudential calls the very, very man at public storage who I had dealt with and asked about me. And he told him that, he, that, that Prudential could rely on me for being honest. And he said every other developer they had done this kind of arrangement with had stiffed them, had uh, walked away from their obligation, all of them but me. And I thought to myself, boy, I had thought about wanting to walk away from the obligation, but I didn't feel it was right. So I didn't. And I was really glad I didn't. Because, because they now later made a commitment of $100 million based upon that, that recommendation. Well, fast forward a few more years. In 2003, five years later, we were getting big enough. We had over 100 properties that we thought about going public. And we went to talk to investment bankers in New York, and, and they uh, recommended we do it. And I knew that it would be a big problem for me personally, if, if because I would be the CEO, I would be in the public limelight. There's a lot of issues with analysts and public disclosure and things like that that are a hassle. And I couldn't sleep. And I got up at 2 in the morning in New York at the hotel, and I walked all the way up and down Manhattan, I must have walked 25 blocks or 30 or 40 blocks north and 40 blocks south, and I was praying, and I was thinking about, should I take on this possibility of taking our company public? Do I really want to do that? And I came back and I told Spence, yes, I felt good about it. I talked to my wife, and um, we took it public. The problem was that a week later, Spence, my partner, got a call to be a mission president. And uh, he left to be a mission president in uh, Richmond, Virginia, six weeks before we went public. <laughs> so we went public on August 11th of 2004. He left on his mission on the 1st of July, 2004. And uh, Richard, in the meantime, moved from Massachusetts to uh, Salt Lake to head up all of our uh, um, development operations. Well, the company came public, and then I had this idea, well, let's go tr see if we can't buy a bigger company. I kind of got a big, a big ideas and took a bold step, and I talked to General Electric about um, purchasing their storage 
company. They owned a storage company that they had purchased that was or had been public and now they had purchased it. It was called Storage USA. We owned at the time we went public 134 properties in 30 states. Storage USA owned 450 properties uh, all around the country. So they were kind of four times as big as we were almost. And I went to GE and they said, well, uh, we're a little bigger than you are. I said, yeah, well, we'd like to buy you. And, they, and so they, after considering, they had problems in the business and, and we knew they weren't doing very well. Well, they put up the company for sale and the price was approximately $2.3 billion. And we were at the time, had a, had a value of about 500 million, our company. So how do you buy something for 2.3 billion when you're only at 500 million? And uh, that was a challenge for us. And so again, we went looking for money and we got turned down by three big entities we thought might consider us. And finally, we went back to Prudential Real Estate, who had been our partner. And we had bought them out when we went public. And we made a presentation to Prudential of why they should help us, and we asked them for $1.8 billion. Now think about that, $1.8 that's a lot of money. Uh, and I remember we were in their conference room and there was eight or 10 people sitting around the table and we gave a presentation of why this was a good deal and why they should do this. And uh, the next day, well actually that day in the room, one man said, our fund will put up 700 million. Another guy said, we'll put up 500 million. And another guy said, we'll put up 300 million. And they went around the room and subscribed the whole $1.8 billion around the room. And can you imagine that you would be in charge of 1.8 billion or 2 billion or $5 billion in your career? It's pretty amazing. These were men that weren't that old. So the next day, they called me and said, you have our commitment for $1.8 billion. In one day, they made the decision. It took about nine months to do the deal. We were able to, about seven months, we were able to negotiate the transaction and purchase Storage USA and merge it into our company. Sometime afterward, this was the largest transaction Prudential Real Estate Advisors had ever done. And I talked to them again and I said, why did you invest $1.8 billion with us? And they said, well, because you've done such a good job for us and you've been such a good partner to us during the time that we were partners. And we knew you'd do the best you could to make it a good investment for us. And it's turned out to be very good for them, by the way. It's, it's, and I thought about that a long time, I thought, what you didn't know was at the time we were going public, our corporate attorney came to me and said, Prudential's not treating us right. We were trying to buy them out of their, you know, do a buy-sell on some of the properties. And, and I said, yeah, but they're our partner. He says, yeah, but they're not treating us right. We need to sue them. And I said, no, we're not going to sue them. We're not going to take that kind of an attitude. They're our partner. We're going to work it out with them. If they take advantage of a little bit, so be it. And, but we're, we're not going to sour what's been a great relationship. And he and I kind of had a big tussle over this. And now it turns out that he didn't know that, you know, a year later we would be, they would be committing $1.8 billion. But it's so interesting how people respond to how you treat them. And in business, if you treat other companies and people that you're doing business with, with integrity and fairness, and honesty, they'll treat you back in the same way. And if they don't, it's too bad for them. Um, so I, I learned a great lesson. I thought about that instance of owning up to the $270,000 from, you know, at this point, 15 years earlier, compared to an investment of $1.8 billion by Prudential. And what an interesting thing, it all stemmed on Something I wasn't sure I wanted to do at the time, something that I was hesitant to do, but what fortunately I did do in being, in being honest. Um, Extraspace today is a, is a large company. It's been fun to build it. Uh, I was called on a mission four years ago and uh, went to Russia for three years uh, and learned how to speak a little Russian. I was uh, Max Sot. Mission President, Maxot Emangazeev, sitting here in the audience. He was, there he is, some of you know him. I was his Mission President, not when he was on a mission, but when he, where his home, 
home branch was in Kazakhstan, which was part of my mission. And I loved doing that. And while I was there, I saw lots of opportunity. Now, you people here are from, I wonder how many different countries. Richard told me that you're from 70 different countries. 70 different countries represented on this campus. I don't know, I'll bet 50 or 60 of them are in this audience. Now, every one of you will have an opportunity when you go home, if you want, to become an entrepreneur. And there'll be plenty of things that you can think about to do. Now, I've got a little more time. Um, I want to tell you, give you some advice on some of the things you want to think about as you're wanting to start your own business. Um, but first I want to tell you a few of my failures. Because I, I just told you my, one of my big successes, which was extra space storage. Let me tell you a couple of failures. I told you about my British partner. He and I started a company to, to uh, sell frozen foods in grocery stores, especially grocery stores, just for frozen foods in northern England, in what they call the high street. And we would lease a, a retail store, and we would fill it up with freezers, and we would just sell frozen foods and a few dry goods. And uh, the business started out pretty well at first. There were other people in the business, and we were competing. And when we got good locations, the stores were profitable. But uh, we got up to 30 stores. But there were certain trends that were going against us. At the time, uh, the large supermarket chains, which had not been very strong, were gaining strength and were building stores on the edges of, of these British cities, you know, huge stores. And gradually, our consumer base went away from us because uh, of the large grocery stores. And finally, about five or six years later, we couldn't compete. Our cost structure wasn't such that we could compete. And uh, the company went under. And we lost everything we invested. And I think about that, and I think, think that, you know, sometimes there's, in, we didn't do anything wrong in terms of the business itself and sort of managing the business. But what we did do wrong was we didn't see clearly the trend of the large supermarkets taking the business away. And uh, you know, it's like being a small retailer today and having Walmart come into your, into, your, uh, into your city. It can really ruin you. And not because you were a bad businessman, but because the trends, the, the economic trends was going on went against you. If we had thought about that more clearly and taken a, a more careful approach, we probably could have avoided that error and avoided all the losses that we, that we created. Um, another one was we, he and I also started an ice cream manufacturing company. And uh, our idea, this is 1985, and at the time there was, no, there was no good ice cream in England, or very little. And we thought, we'll bring high quality American ice cream to England. So we did. We started a little factory. We had three employees and a little garage, and we were making ice cream. And, and uh, we started trying to sell it, but it didn't sell. No one wanted it. We had a really tough time. And after about two, two or three years of losses trying to sell this ice cream that we thought was great, but no one wanted to pay for, uh, we brought in a new young CEO. He was 27 years old. His name's James Lambert. And he said, no, we shouldn't do this. We should do what the market wants. Well, what does the market want? Well, the market wanted cheap ice cream, cheap British ice cream. It didn't want expensive American ice cream. And so he went to some grocery stores, got a contract to manufacture inexpensive, cheap British ice cream, and the business took off. And he built the business. And he focused his strategy on manufacturing efficiencies, not on the best ice cream in the world, not on the, but on manufacturing efficiencies. And it wasn't long before, well, it was long, 15 years later, the company became the largest manufacturer of ice cream in the UK with 70% of its business, or 80%, no, 90% of its business being private label, not its own label. So if it was the Sainsbury grocery store, it was the Sainsbury brand. If it was the uh, Tesco grocery store, it was Tesco brand. And we had 70% of the market share of all private label ice cream sold in England. Why? 
because we didn't focus on marketing, we focused on manufacturing efficiencies, and we became the most efficient manufacturer of ice cream in the UK. So what started out as a failure, because we were trying to make something that the market didn't want, became a success when we changed strategy and, and made something that the market did want. And the last one I'm going to tell you about is there's an airline in the US called JetBlue Airways. Anybody heard of that? JetBlue? Okay, a few of you have. It was founded by an LDS fellow by the name of David Neeleman. David was my uh, next door neighbor. And he and I, he had founded an earlier airline called uh, Morris Air and had been quite successful and sold it to Southwest Airlines. And then he wanted to found a new airline and I invested some money in his new airline at the very beginning. And the, the airline took off, it, was, it started in 2000, I think, or maybe 1999. Did very well, it went public. My stock went way up in value and I made a great killing on my investment. Now, have you ever heard of the story of the guy who's, who starts to gamble for the first time and he puts down his money on the slot machine and he makes a uh, uh, jackpot the first time? That was like me, okay? So I got hooked. I thought, airlines, that's great. So someone came to me and said, uh, we'd like to start a new airline to cross the Atlantic, just like JetBlue. And would you invest? So I said, okay, I'll invest. Well, long story short, the airline didn't become a low-cost airline. It became a high-priced airline, uh, doing business class only across the Atlantic. And uh, we thought we had a great niche. It turned out that oil prices went up, the economy went in the tank, and we lost everything. And it was a failure. And you know, if you look back on it, if I look back on it now, Part of the reason it was a failure was oil prices went up. And we probably, no matter what our strategy would have done, we would have lost everything. But the other, and, and so sometimes in business, things go against you, not because of what you did, but just because of the circumstances of world events and you can't control. Uh, but I don't think our strategy was the best either. And uh, it was a very hard lesson for me in that it cost me more than half of all that I'd ever earned in all my whole life because of that airline. Um, and the investments I made. So those are some of my big mistakes. Now let me just tell you a few words of advice and then we'll take some questions um, about starting businesses. Um, if you're starting a new business, don't have too many news. What do I mean by that? New market, new customer, new product, new technology, new this, new that, everything. One of the problems of having too many new, the word new, news, uh, is that you increase the risk by the number of different news that you have. So if you've got a new invention going to a new market using a new technology to manufacture the invention, you may find it very tough to get it to be adopted. But if you take an existing, already proven concept or and you apply it to a different market or a different geography, you may have a better chance to win. In other words, often some of the biggest successes are an improvement of one technology. For example, Microsoft, one of the greatest companies of all. Was Microsoft the first company to do an operating system for computers, for personal computers? No, it wasn't. Microsoft's uh, MS-DOS was one of many DOSs that were around in the early 80s, the late 70s, and they made theirs a little bit better and they were able to get the contract with IBM and then they were able to build a business uh, off of something that wasn't an invention from scratch. Was Apple the first company to make a mobile computing device telephone? No. Who was it? Was it BlackBerry? No. Who was it? Remember the trio, Palm? It was Palm Pilot, which became the trio. Now, they didn't win. They, they did not win the race, but Apple won the race. So sometimes we, we say pioneers get shot by Indians. And maybe sometimes you may find to be the super pioneer may not be the best way to go. So you, you, you may find a, a better product or taking an existing product to a new market may be easier. Like I've been in Kazakhstan, where Maksat lives, and I noticed there's no McDonald's hamburger stores in Kazakhstan. Why? I don't know why. 
but, but I know it would work in Almaty. In 1980, I took a trip to Taiwan and to Hong Kong. And I went to Hong Kong and I saw there was a McDonald's in Hong Kong, very successful. Then I was in Taipei and there was no McDonald's. I thought, why? If it's successful in Hong Kong, it ought to be successful in Taipei. I came back to the United States, I called McDonald's, I said, I want the franchise for Taiwan. They said, really? Okay, You're, you know, we'd take an application for you, you need a Chinese local partner, et cetera, et cetera. And I started working on it and then I dropped it because I was involved in other things. If you go to Taiwan today, there's, there's I don't know how many. Uh, can you imagine the guy who got the, the, uh, the, the franchise for McDonald's in Taiwan? Now there are other McDonald's in all of your countries that may be opportunities for you because there's an opportunity of taking something that works in America and see if you can adapt it and use it in your local com country. Um, another little saying, cater to the masses, live with the wealthy. Cater to the wealthy, live with the masses. Now, here, here's what I'm saying here. Cater to the masses. Get a product that everybody needs. Self-storage, we have 515,000 customers renting self-storage for me. 90% of the U.S. population is renting self-storage. That's the masses. How many people are using the Windows operating system? Everybody's using it. That's catering to the, so when you find something that is ubiquitous or needs, is needed everywhere, you're more likely to make a real fortune doing it than if you find a nit, something that's too niche, that's only going to be sold to wealthy people. You know, the opposite would be serving and catering, having a, 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 a specialty tailor shop in Honolulu tailored to uh, making $3,000 suits for wealthy businessmen. You know, you're not going to be really making money doing that. So as you think about opportunities, think about something that caters to the masses. Um, how about balance in your life? Most of your LDS, you're going to have husbands and wives. Uh, you're going to have a church calling. You're going to have children. You can't devote your whole life to your business. Now, my wife would complain that I devoted too much time to my business, but I also tried to have some balance in my life. And you, for your own sanity and for your own long-run strength, you have to p learn to pace yourself and not just to be so, so think single-minded that you're working 20 hours a day and ruining your body trying to make something happen. You have to have balance to be successful. Um, Think when, okay, how much do I have? I got 10 minutes, okay, I'll take two more. Think win-win, when you're negotiating with people, think about the other person's point of view. Try and leave a little on the table. Try and figure out how he can win and you can win at the same time. You probably all have heard this. It's worked very well for me in my whole life. Always in negotiations, I try and think of the other person's point of view. And I try and leave them. In, in, in many cases, I can't come to an agreement because there's no meeting of the minds. And I just say, I'm sorry, I can't do what you'd like to do. It's not going to work for me. I hope you do well. And then we leave it at that. But you don't ever want to, uh, for example, a good example for extra space would, we're a very strong company today. And we employ a lot of small contractors to build things. I would never want our company to take advantage of the small guy who's building something for us and not pay him or not do what we agreed to do just because we're stronger or bigger. Never take advantage of people. It will come back to haunt you in a very negative way. Also, on the other side, your reputation is gold. So if you can keep a good reputation by being totally honest and being fair in all you do, it will be a great blessing to you. Now, in, in ending, I would like to say this about entrepreneurship. When you are an entrepreneur and you build a business, hopefully you are employing people and you're providing a valuable product and service for our society. None of the things that you see in this room 
would have been manufactured or built or available without entrepreneurs who started the company to make the flooring, the cement, the chairs, the audio equipment, the computers, the exit signs, everything in this room. This university could not exist without the tithing money paid by the people who work and the businesses who made a profit and the tithing that was given here. Uh, the government employees couldn't work without the profits of companies that paid their taxes and people who earned money. Capitalism is a good thing if it's properly channeled. When you become an entrepreneur and you give other people's jobs, you can provide a great blessing and it will help you, it will help many people. And lastly, I'd like to say business is fun, make it fun, uh, enjoy your life, uh, set goals for yourself, don't try and do it right out of college. You might have a small business for fun to, to get some practice, but you're not going to, uh, it's going to be unlikely you'll build a, a big business right out of college. Get some experience on someone else's, on someone else's dime.